many mammals have really been the center of um, ecological studies. Um, and they have a lot of unique attributes and patterns which allow them to um, be studied as ecological uh, specimens. A great example of this is, of course, the beaver, the American beaver. And it's uh, commonly referred to as a keystone species or one in which has a um, overwhelming effect on the living things in its environment because it is also a landscape engineer, changes the landscape through the building of the dams, which creates a whole new set of uh, dynamics for living things to survive. And so many species depend on the uh, beaver and its alteration of the landscape in order to survive. Um, so this is just one example of ecology and how mammals are um, at the center of, of many ecological studies. But we're going to talk about a lot of principles and then kind of intermingle some of the mammals which have been important for those aspects. First off, what is ecology? Well, it's the study of both abiotic and biotic factors, so living and non-living factors, and how they affect the living things there. So it's one thing to under, understand an individual um, um, in, in its environment or what it does or how it works, but uh, ecology is generally, especially with mammals, looking at these larger scales, so looking at populations and how populations are um, uh, diverse and what are the factors which affect those populations and its growth and its um, decrease in growth and so on. And then also community, so what are interactions between different species and how does that, how do those affect each of those species as well. Um, and then beyond that, the ecosystem itself. So what are both the non-living and living things in that ecosystem and how do they all affect each other? So they, they can get, e ecology can get very complicated um, and really any discipline um, within science can also be applied to ecology and understanding how living things fit in their environment and affect their environment and are affected by it. So what is the environment then of living things? Well, we can break it down to, again, these things, abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic factors are these things which are not living. So the climate, the weather, the geology, the hydrology, um, the water cycle is very important to living things. How much water is available in an ecosystem affects the type of organisms that can live there uh, and is one of the major functions of an ecosystem. But biotic factors then are also very important. So this fish and this turtle, they may not directly um, compete for space, but maybe through another living thing, such as a prey item, such as this fish, um, they could compete um, for that resource. And so uh, their individual species um, uh, are equally affected by each other in their presence or absence or strength of their population or growth and so on and so forth. So uh, these factors um, are important for understanding how a species or population then lives within its environment. Um, one of the ways that we can then characterize these um, abiotic factors, at least on a large scale, large scale is through what we have, uh, we, we call biomes. Biomes are geographical regions that have predicted abiotic factors, so the climate generally, which is the temperature, precipitation, um, topography is also important, um, and how it then affects these conditions over long term, regular, predictable amounts of time. So the easiest one to think about is a desert. A desert, you know, is hot, dry, um, has uh, temporal fluctuations throughout the day. Um, you know, very hot in the day and generally cool at night. 
Um, and we can find deserts um, really according to latitude. Generally, they are um, not on the equator, but just above and below the equator. Um, and this is because of fi factors that affect uh, the wind patterns of the earth and also the precipitation and evaporation patterns of the earth. Um, but all these other ecotones are found in specific regions based on latitude then um, and or uh, elevation. So you find these same gradations of biomes when you go up a mountain um, as when you go up in latitude or down in latitude. Um, they each also have their own successional patterns after disturbance events. So this is looking at how plants and animals reestablish and grow after something you know changes the landscape such as a fire or a flood. Um, and these are going to be different based on the biome. So fires are going to be um, characteristic of the chaparral. Um, floods you're going to find in areas that are tropical and have wet and dry seasons. And the uh, response of living things to these disturbance regimes um, is specific to those biomes as well. So one of the biotic factors then, or um, disciplines within ecology is population ecology. A population then is an inter, inter, a group of interbreeding individuals usually within a distinct area. So this population may be studied within a mountain valley or a stream ecosystem or something like that. Metapopulations then look at multiple populations which um, generally have some sort of corridor for immigration and emigration um, which allows gene flow between these these populations. Um, uh, mammals also fill a specific niche, most all animals do, um, which is defined as the resources they used within their environment. But um, they aren't uh, even within their home range you know, where they are found throughout their geographic distribution, um, they are selective in the areas in which they live. And we call these um, small differences within a landscape a microhabitat. Okay, and so mammals are going to use these to monitor, like we've discussed, their temperature, um, which is going to affect their physiology and their ability to maintain homeostasis. Uh, so an example is in winter, um, small mammals are exposed to the cold, you know, in the fall and the winter, um, and generally have a really hard time maintaining homeostasis until um, they get snow cover. And that snow cover actually acts as insulation and allows these small mammals to move around and also stay hidden from predators. Um, so the, the microhabitat and the changes in the dynamics within um, where they live also affects what resources they can use and what resources are available. Um, another example of habitat preferences which allow then for uh, different species to inhabit similar areas or different areas or different microhabitats within the same area are granivorous mammals in North American deserts. Um, so these generally vary in sizes and those sizes then uh, depend on uh, or affect the type of locomotion they use, the type of seeds they can, um, they can take advantage of and eat. Um, and so you have uh, a kind of uh, breakdown or specialization by each of these different species in slightly different microhabitats and slightly different niches. 
Um, and so again, mammals are not found uniformly throughout their geographic distribution. This is coyotes um, in North America. They're found now, um, you know, pretty much all over North America. But that doesn't mean you'll find them uniformly distributed between them. They're going to like certain areas more than others. They like to travel through corridors such as roads or um, along streams. And, um, and that goes the same for other mammals as well, such as those that are burrowing. Um, and then how these um, species then move um, and disperse um, is another um, way to study populations. So m most species of mammal have natal dispersal where they're going to go away from their place of birth or one sex or the other will. Um, and this reduces inbreeding. So if you have related species just staying in the same area continuously, the likelihood of them um, having genetic diseases or genetic conditions that are negative increase. So by dispersing, they can reduce that. Um, and so some examples of this, naked mole rats actually uh, in their populations are generally very related, but there is one morph, so one um, uh, different type of uh, physical characteristics um, which is commonly found, which disperses. It has no desire to stay within its um, native population and it will actually go to a different population. Um, this also reduces in some um, mammal populations, disperse, reduces the competition for uh, mates. So lions, uh, when they are the males grow to a certain maturity. Um, they will, when, when they become a threat to the males, which are dominant over that area, generally disperse from that uh, that area, um, that group, because they become a threat to the dominant male there, um, and so they may they will have, they will go and find their own mates. Um, it sometimes reduces resource competition. So in ground squirrels, um, when an area is you know overrun, it'll go off into another area and find more resources there. Um, and some dispersal is innate, meaning um, there you know it may have originally been for some of these, but the current um, way in which they disperse is based just on genetics or. Um, with these building ground squirrels, after they get a certain amount of body fat, then they disperse. Um, and it doesn't, there are no other indicators for why it does that, just other than it already has this mechanism genetically um, entrained in its populations. Home ranges, um, then, of, of these populations, they often uh, overlap in populations or overlap in individuals um, and generally but generally only in borders so a home range um, is going to be more efficient when it is smaller so um, as a mammal becomes more aware of where its resources are and becomes more familiar with its um, area it can then condense itself and uh, spend less energy traveling and more specializing on gathering the food and other resources it needs um, so a an individual is going to develop a home range as small as possible for efficiency but they will need to overlap at some point for um, you know, if enough resources are available. Uh, some species disperse and are constantly moving um, in because of food, food availability, such as the wildebeest, Serengeti wildebeest. So they go in this constant um, circular migration um, based on water availability, food availability, um, and they travel as a herd around in these areas. 
Um, marine mammals, many of them also migrate um, much, much greater distances than terrestrial mammals as well. And, and that seems to be based on um, food abundance and also extreme uh, condition avoidance. So these northern latitudes in the ocean generally have very productive temporary um, food availability. Um, so they will go there for the food and then they will have to leave in the winter because it gets too cold and they'll go to more tropical areas. So here's a list of your book of some of the home ranges of some of the some species of mammals, a whole range of them. The common shrew, very small mammal, of course, is a very small home range. Um, and some have a very large uh, home range. Um, so for example, the grizzly bear, 50,000 acres it needs for a mother and three yearlings. Um, and it has to roam within there to find all the resources it needs to survive. So grizzly bears actually don't live in highly productive areas and so they need a lot of um, area in order to uh, diversify their um, their diets and get enough energy to survive. Okay, so another way to study populations is through life history patterns. So really understanding um, at what age uh, they sexually mature, um, how long are they with their uh, mother until they are weaned, um, once they sexually mature, when do they reproduce and for how long, and then when do they, you know, finally senesce and die. Um, and by looking at a cohort table, or a cohort would be the annual income of young, uh, and then following them from year after year to see, you know, what are their survivability, reproductive rate, and so on and so forth. And using that cohort table, then you can look at then these life tables. So all these variables then line up with these different um, life history uh, characteristics. So the probability of survival for, uh, this is for a species of bat in Costa Rica. Um, in, in year one, they're all just born. So 100% of them are born. But those that make it to the next year uh, are only about 53%. Okay, so the survivability rate is, there's a lot of um, death from that first year. Those that make it to the second year are only 25% um, from there. So most of them die within the first year and then by year 10 they are all dead. So you get um, life expectancy from this. You can also calculate then the uh, reproductive rate which you can then use. You can use all this to understand then population growth. Now, there are different ways in which um, populations will grow. Uh, exponential growth, this is generally not um, a, for very long, so this is a temporary trend in growth, um, and that occurs under unrestricted ideal conditions. So there's lots of resources, lots of um, space available for um, the species which is growing. So here is seal pups. Um, which grew over the, you know, this is a 50, 40 year study. And probably what's happening here is actually the seal pups are increasing in number because they are rebounding from, um, from, from some sort of population demise. So there's very few of them uh, for a very long time. And then because they are not being killed or hunted anymore, then they're going to increase in population, have unlimited, unrestricted growth. Um, but at some point, they're going to have, um, that growth is cannot continue. Um, and that will be capped off by the number of resources available or the carrying capacity. Now then, how uh, these growth rates um, occur then is, a function of both density dependent and density independent factors. Density dependent factors are those which change according to how many are in the population. So competition, disease, predation, 
uh, you know, how much food is available is going to decrease the more that are in the population. Um, disease is more often transmitted in higher density populations. Um, and then there's density independent factors. So these are things that occur that would affect all of the species um, at random or regardless of how many are in there. So an oil spill would kill, you know, whatever species get in the oil. Um, and that wouldn't depend on how many species are there. Population growth um, cycles in some mammals in a very predictable um, way. And this is, there have been a number of theories to understand kind of how this happens in different species. A population cycle um, has four parts, the increase, the peak, the decrease, and then the low density. And so this is um, studying voles over 15 years. Um, and it looks like they did trapping in autumn and spring. Um, and as you can see, the population rises and falls and rises and falls in a pretty predictable pattern. Um, some of the factors that affect then these cycles include just intrinsic mechanisms. So within the population itself, at high densities, their morphology will change. Their genetics seem to control uh, their behaviors. Their ability to fight off disease decreases. Um, and all of these things then are at play to control the population. Um, and it has this yin and yang, basically, where it increases and decreases. Um, there also, of course, is extrinsic mechanisms, so things affecting outside the population, um, including how much food is available and then how many things are eating it. Okay, so then looking then beyond populations at the next scale up uh, at communities, um, how many different species are within an area? Um, this can be measured through richness, which is basically just counting species, or evenness, um, which takes into account how many of each species are there. Um, and so evenness actually gives us a better idea of not only how many species are there, but how many um, make up the total number of species there. Um, most ecosystems have a lot of very few individuals. Um, so in number, most, most of the individuals in an area are going to be of the same species. And then a few of of uh, some other species. Um, one area where this has been studied extensively is on islands and what people noticed when they first started doing excursions and looking at the biodiversity of species is that larger islands had more species and to understand that there's a number of factors that went into it including uh, of course the size but also um, how close it is to a mainland and thus how many species can go and colonize that area. Um, if there is a lot of colonization, then there's going to be a lot of con competition, and so some are going to be outcompeted and go extinct. Um, and then also the process of speciation. So the species that are there um, or that immigrate there can also go through adaptive radiations and create um, many different species from the one. Um, but the number of species on these islands generally stays the same, but the species themselves change as more colonize and others go extinct. Okay, so at communities, at the community level, you're, you're, you're also studying the interactions between species. One of the ways to look at this through um, just who eats you who is, is essentially predation this is where one is positively affected and the other is negatively affected of course because it dies um, and so we create these food webs to look at then this is interactions between mammals and their prey um, and they can become very complicated um, and dynamic and this one is actually simplified as well um, but then there are many other um, ways in which mammalian species interact between each other. So for example, com competition, which you can also see on this food web, 
um, these three species eat the same food resource and so there's going to be some competition there mutualism um, which is not on here uh, but can be seen when looking at oak trees and their mass production or their acorn production um, that's going to positively influence a number of species that eat it uh, deer and mice um, and the oak trees also get a positive benefit um, by allowing those seeds to be dispersed. Um, competition, mutualism, um, and predation we've covered. Parasitism then uh, is also important to uh, in this association uh, in the form of ticks. So ticks um, will pass they are a parasite to mice and deer, and they'll also pass a pathogen, uh, Lyme disease, to mice and deer. Um, and so that's where one is positively associated, one is negatively associ uh, associated, but generally does not um, kill it or, or consume it. Uh, Lyme disease can kill um, deer or mice and humans. Um, but the tick itself, it takes such a small amount of blood that it doesn't um, kill its host, but it may weaken it. Um, immensalism, immensalism and commensalism then are uh, where one is, commensalism is where one is positively, it's, um, positively affected, the other is neutrally affected. Um, immensalism is where one is neutrally affected and the other is negatively affected. And so those are the different interactions. Now, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg and we'll, we'll give a lot more um, information in class with mammalian ecology. And ecology itself is very complex um, and there's lots to it as well. But th this is a good intro then, hopefully, for um, understanding mammals and uh, the many aspects of ecology which affect them.